Hello and welcome to Bitcoin with Jake. I'm speaking with Brian Estes. Welcome, Brian. How are you? Doing well. Thank you, Jake. Now, what a pleasure to have you on the show. I, I mentioned offline that I'd heard you on Robert Breedlove's brilliant What Is Money show and a, um, a listener of mine, Gary Larkin, shout out to Gaz, had recommended you come and join me. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, th this is a, a conversation that will be hopefully um, very focused on personal journey and particularly around uh, Bitcoin. So just to kick things off, you have a friend somewhere who told you about Bitcoin probably, or you have a moment in time when you first came across it, perhaps a few touch points. Um, talk us through how you first came across Bitcoin, Brian. Yeah, when I first learned about Bitcoin, I thought it was a total scam. So <laughs> let's start there. Uh, I, I come from traditional finance. So I was an institutional equity broker for 14 years. And then I managed a registered investment advisory firm for 10 years. And so coming from that background, you know, traditional finance was my background. But when I first got introduced to Bitcoin, I saw Cameron and Tyler Winkleboss on CNBC talking about it when it was $100 a Bitcoin. And um, like I said, when I first saw that, I, you know, I didn't know anything about it. thought it was a, you know, a scam. You know, put it on my watch list, though. I just thought it was kind of interesting. So this is 2014. Um, I watched it go from $100 up to $1,200. And then Mt. Gox, which was the largest custodian of Bitcoin at the time, got hacked. A Russian hacker sold 850,000 Bitcoin out of the exchange. The exchange filed for bankruptcy. And then Bitcoin crashed from $1,200 down to around $300. And when it went down, that 75%. Um, yeah, I'm a value manager, so I thought maybe there was some opportunity, you know, that could be out there. And so that's when I really dove into like what Bitcoin is and read the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper. Um, I really didn't understand it the first time I read it. And, you know, I, the second time I read it, it was the fog was starting to clear a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And then the third time I read it on the third day, um, it like just clicked with me. Wow. And the third time I, I just understood how we are going to rebuild our entire financial system on this technology, on blockchain technology. And um, after I understood that, like I couldn't sleep for a week and I would lay in bed. Wow. My wife would yell at me, like, why can't you sleep? <laughs> I'm like, I'm just like, you know, you, you know, this blockchain thing, it's like, it's the future and I need to be involved with it. And so I finally convinced her to let me sell my practice. Um, I sold my RIA. And then I became a venture capitalist mm -hmm. in the blockchain space back in 2014. And I started helping to finance, build, and you know, mentor blockchain companies back then. Wow. So many cool areas to, to focus on. Um, we'll, we'll probably cycle back around to what you've done post-2014. But <clears throat> what is an equity broker, for those that don't understand? And, and mm -hmm. the... Um, the career path that you'd been through up to 2013, 14, like what kind of skills do you learn? Um, what are you focused on every day? What does that teach you that process? Yeah. So when I graduated from college, um, I was 22 years old, went to work at a company called AG Edwards and Sons, which was a stock brokerage firm, like a financial advisory firm. Um, so I started with them. And I was handling like retail clients, people basically investing in municipal bonds or, you know, stocks or, you know, just helping them, you invest their money. Um, after a few years of doing the retail side, I figured there were a lot bigger fish out there. So I started calling on big institutional clients mm -hmm. and I ended up landing some of the like, really big funds that are out there. So um, Fidelity was um, one of my clients, uh, Vanguard, uh, Bank of America Trust Company, um, like a couple of insurance companies. And so I transitioned from the retail side over to the institutional side. And what that means is I, I would take our research that AG Edwards would produce and I would go out and I would peddle it or sell it to these institutions. And if they liked our stock ideas, then in exchange for that research, they would buy that stock from us. They would build that position through us. So we would earn commissions whenever they would buy or sell those stocks. And that's how, you know, that's how that worked. Mm -hmm. So, and then um, in 2004, um, I decided to leave AG Edwards and start my own company. Um, which was basically just financial management for mainly in, um, institutional investors like endowments and foundations. So I did that for 10 years um, up through 2014. And so um, just to kind of really simplify things, large companies have 
uh, stockpiled cash over the years. They want to invest it in certain ways and they're looking for opportunities. They go to the market, so to speak, and it's like an array of different competing brokers that have different analysts sitting within their firms that are essentially mm-hmm. selling ideas, right? Um, right. So I, I, I was like, the, that? So you, yeah, I was, the, I was basically the liaison between our analyst mm-hmm. and the investment firm seeking that research. Wow. So I'd work with their portfolio managers to figure out what sectors they were interested in. And then I would find companies that we covered that fit into their portfolio and then make that introduction and cultivate that relationship. And I think therefore it's very safe to say, Brian, that over the years you've got very good at selling investment ideas. (laughs) Yeah. I would imagine that's that's the rest of the whole thing. I had no idea the job was a sales job when I first started. (laughs) I was 22 years old and, yeah. During the interview process, um, the vice chairman of AG Edwards asked me to sell her a pencil. Mm. And I was like, what does this have to do with like being a you know, financial manager, financial consultant, you know, but it, it was a hundred percent sales job. Wow. And, and out of interest, did you sell the pencil or? I did. <laughs> I got the job. Those, so, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. one of those questions. It's, it's not necessarily what you say. It's how you react to the question, I imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, how interesting. Okay. And so 2004, you're like, right, I think I can have a go at this myself. Talk me through how like starting your own business felt and what were the, the, some of the, the challenges that you came across during that process. Yeah. So I decided to leave AG Edwards um, for a couple of reasons. One is that um, the compliance issues around being a broker started to become very, very restrictive and it wasn't allowing me to do the best job for my clients. And what I mean by that is there were limitations on how we could communicate with our clients. And it was basically restricted to phone. And, you know, I had over a thousand clients and there's no way I can call a thousand people in a day or two. And so, you know, we had email back then. So I'd want to email people information or send them a, like a a letter, a, a paper letter. And just the compliance around that was just so cumbersome. And, you know, it took, you know, you know, usually a week to get approved by compliance, anything that we wanted to put in writing. Mm-hmm. And it just, it made it, like, like I said, you know, too difficult to do a good job for my clients. So that was one reason. The second reason is that um, AG Edwards was in the process of, um, they, they hired a new CEO and it was kind of, the writing was on the wall that he was interested in selling the company. And the company had, you know, been around for over 150 years. Um, run by the family and over 20% of the equity was still owned by the employees and the family. And, um, you know, he was doing things at the company I, I didn't agree with. And so I, I decided, you know, I'd be better off on my own. So I, I, I left and out of the thousand clients, I asked my top 100 to come with me um, to my new firm. Wow. And um, I had 96 of the 100 come with wow. me. Wow. Yeah. And, um, and, but it was scary, you know, I was 34 at the time and, you know, I never started my own company or, Mm -hmm. you know, it was, you know, and I I had a pretty good gig going, you know, at AG Edwards, I, you know, you know, had a good revenue stream and, you know, the job wasn't that hard and, you know, but yeah, it was, it was a big risk that, you know, ended up paying off. And that, that risk, I mean, it's, so fascinating to me entrepreneurs you know they're they're everywhere in some ways and um people see opportunities in situations where they have again a unique lens like i mentioned this just before and i think that's where we'll get to with bitcoin but um it was a risk but you didn't see it as such a big risk that you didn't take it um i'm intrigued by like people's mindset when it comes to that thing so did you just have a gut instinct this was the right thing to do uh, what yeah, was it? So I was, you just woke up and thought, fuck it, this is definitely the way I want to go. No, no, it was, um, so we had, you know, children in junior high at the time, mm-hmm. saving for college, you know, like I couldn't be imprudent and, you know, I, I had to make a good decision for our family. Um, but what gave me the confidence to do it was that when I did my study abroad at Cambridge University back in 1988, um, I learned about what are called S-curves. And so S curves are the way you measure the adoption of new technologies. And I used that back in the early 90s to have a lot of my clients in the computer companies like Intel, Dell, you know, Microsoft, Cisco back in the 90s. And then um, when the internet started, 
I had a lot of my clients in internet stocks. And then when the mobile internet started, you know, I put a lot, a big portion of my money, my personal money and my clients money in Apple stock because they were the dominant mobile internet provider. And so, you know, based on S curve analysis, you know, I, I knew this blockchain invention was going to be the next new mega trend. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was successful in computers and I was successful in internet. Mm -hmm. I was successful in mobile internet. Mm -hmm. And so I had the confidence that, you know, this blockchain thing was going to, you know, be the next big thing. Brilliant. And, and the S curve, like just talk us through what you mean by that. And I'm intrigued as to what Cambridge was like in 1988. So having grown up in the UK, um, uh -huh. actually born in 1988. So, um, oh, really? yeah, so, so I'm actually 34 as of a few weeks ago. So it's interesting in terms of like, a, I have a baby and another one on the way and thinking about like starting businesses, it is risky, but it all, you know, if you have confidence in what you're going to do, then is it so bad? Um, yeah. yeah, before we digress into myself, it's more just, I'm interested about S curve. So what, what okay. a high so, level, so, so talk us through that. So what an S curve is, it's the way to measure the adoption of new technologies. And basically what it says is that the amount of time it takes for a new technology to go from 0% adoption to 10% adoption is the same amount of time it takes to go from 10% adoption to 90% adoption. And so let's use like computers, for example. So Apple invented the personal computer back in 1977. Um, but by, it was like 1980 when like one tenth of 1% of US households had a personal computer. So we'll use 1980 as the, the baseline, you know, the, the, you know, the first one tenth of 1%. By 1990, 10% of US households had a personal computer. So when I graduated from college in 1990, um, my parents gave me an IBM PS2 computer for my graduation present. I was one of the 10% of households who now had a personal computer. And so, you know, it took 10 years ago from 0% to 10%. Mm -hmm. So that means over the next 10 years, it should go from 10% adoption to 90% adoption. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the adoption of personal computers by 1991, 1999, it was right around 90%. Wow. And so, and you could use that S curve for, you know, shipping companies in the 1400s, railroads in the 1800s, mm -hmm. you know, automobiles in the 1940s and 50s, mm -hmm. washing machines, you know, fax machines, microwave ovens, you know, cell phones. It's all the same S curve. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so based on that, you know, what it tells us is that Bitcoin hit 10% adoption in 2019 today it's around 50 percent and what it tells us is that by 2029 it should be at 90 percent wow. and that's just in the u.s that's not worldwide yeah i was going to say where are you where are you drawing that from so yeah i'm looking at you, US you feel office. that the, um because that would be probably the biggest adoption number that i've ever heard anyone say so you feel in the states about 50 percent of americans own bitcoin yeah so where, the, where wow. that data comes from is um, so in 2019, it hit 10%. Okay. Um, in 2020, Brian Brooks, the comptroller of the U.S. currency, said it was 15%. The Biden administration and their executive order used 25%, but that's a 2021 number. Mm. Okay. And then the Motley Fool did a survey of 3,000 adult Americans, mm -hmm. and they were at 56%. Wow. So wow, that's 25, really the low side, you know, so, you know, it's, it's close to 50%. And, and if so you, you just talk to people in the U S and, you know, ask around about one out of two people own. Yeah. Bitcoin. Okay. Uh, and I guess the next question is like, what kind of meaningful position size do they have in Bitcoin? Is it like $5 or is it 50% of what they own? But yeah, I don't I guess, ask that. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I yeah. guess that's part of the next the next five. So you mentioned, sorry. So you you feel that ninety percent adoption in the states will arrive by what by what date? So no, two thousand twenty nine. Mm -hmm. Wow, which is not far, really, is it? Yeah, it's seven more years, six and a half. Whoa. years. Wow. Okay. And so brilliant. So this is exactly what these conversations I love so much. So the S curve, like nineteen eighty eight. You're a student. It's a formative time in your life. You you come across this um, this theory that historically maps to technology trends, and then you just happen to be in the investment space when you know the the, the internet, the mobile wave kicks in, and then finally we've hit this <clears throat> let's say blockchain phase. 
Um, so it has all the same hallmarks of the same process is what you're saying. Interesting. Yeah, and, yeah, noticed- and what, what gave me some insight mm-hmm. too was back when I was in junior high, when I was, I think I was 13 at the time. Um, I, that's when I started coding on computers. So, you know, computers were, you know, just come out. Um, my first computer was a Sinclair 20 computer. Um, and then I had like a Commodore 64. And, you know, so, you know, when I was in my, you know, early teens, I, I was one of those computer nerds. And, you know, and I, I coded all the way up through high school. I used to write code for the Air Force when I was in high school. Wow. Um, and, but when I went to college in 1986, you know, this is pre-internet. I didn't think there was a future in computers. You know, I was just doing it for fun. I just like doing wow. it. And um, so I, you know, ended up getting a degree in finance and economics. But it was that combination of early knowledge of computers and coding plus the finance that kind of combined into me understanding what Bitcoin was back in 2014. Mm. And, and very open-ended question, but what is Bitcoin and what does it represent to you? Mm-hmm. So all Bitcoin is a software. It's open source internet protocol software that we use every day. So when you send an email, you use what's called SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. Um, when you get on the internet, you're using what's called HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Um, when you own a domain name, that's open source internet protocol. It's called DNS. Um, so that's all Bitcoin is. It's open source internet protocol software. But what it allows us to do, instead of sending data like an email or access information like the World Wide Web or having a domain name, what, it, what the Bitcoin software does is allows us to send value through the internet safely and securely without having a third party approve or clear that transaction for us. So that's all it is. It's just a piece of software. And it's funny when you summarize it or boil it down to something like as as simple as you've just made out, it's just extraordinary. The headlines that it gets, the, the, the negative press, the, the seeming kind of, um, hostility to it from so many places i mean even when you go to a drinks party or you try and talk to your family or friends about it sometimes people are just like what what are you talking about no go away this doesn't make any sense um yeah and i guess it was on the third reading of the white paper that you go oh okay now i get what this is um and so how do you see it uh, evolving over time and perhaps the, the impact that it's already made um and i know that uh, you run a fund for example so um you know you're building a business around this innovation um what does that look like so i want to go back to um you know there is a lot of negative negativity around bitcoin sure um that's because it's so um it, it's trying to displace a lot of industries so it's you know the people the incumbents are scared of what's going to happen to them Mm-hmm. So those are traditional finance companies like banks um, or anyone that processes financial transaction and takes a fee for doing that. Their business models are in jeopardy. So do you remember Blockbuster video? Do you yeah. remember? Did, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So Netflix came along and disrupted Blockbuster, right? Because you had a digital version rather than getting these cassette tapes or these CDs, yeah. right? Um, I don't know. Have you ever paid a long distance phone bill? You know what um, that is? Well, so when I was, I went traveling in 2006 um, mm-hmm. and that was, I mean, mobiles didn't really, they hadn't, I mean, they, they weren't long, they weren't capable of doing long distance, you know, pay as you go was still like okay. expensive for just a, a domestic call. So yeah, I have to, have to buy a phone card and go to a, <clears throat> a small phone box in Asia somewhere and try and get, you know, dial up the landline back at home. Yeah. So what, what the, traditionally the way the phone system worked is that, you can make local calls for free and the long distance would, there would be a charge for that, mm-hmm. right? You're calling a long distance. And then all of a sudden, you know, about probably, I guess it was probably 15, 15, 17 years ago. Um, the phone company stopped charging long distance rates. Do you know why? Um, well, I'm going to guess cause they shifted to an internet based system. Yeah. There was a piece of software invented called voice over internet protocol. VoIP, uh, VoIP, yeah, which, okay. now, which now made phone calls free, right? So wow. you don't have to pay for long distance anymore because you can use the internet to make a voice over internet protocol call. Mm-hmm. And so that's what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is money over internet protocol. Mm-hmm. And so 
we don't have to pay a bank or pay PayPal or Visa or MasterCard to move our money anymore. Mm. You know, we have this Bitcoin network. And so if you look at the amount of transactions that went through the Bitcoin network last year, it was $3 trillion worth of value. Wow. MasterCard was 7 trillion and Visa was 13 trillion. Wow. But the Bitcoin network is growing much faster than Visa and MasterCard. And so it's projected if Bitcoin continues to grow at the same rate, it's going to be larger than MasterCard in 18 months. And it's going to be larger than Visa in three years. And it will be the largest payment system in the world in three years. And so that's why it's disruptive. You know, the banks, Visa, MasterCard, they're, they're worried that their business models are going to get entirely disrupted because of this software, this voiceover, or this money over in a protocol software. And then it's just so incredible as, as investors, you can buy a piece of that growth, basically. Exactly. This, this yeah. is the cool part yes. of it, right? So it's you know, whatever angle you come to Bitcoin from, the, the truth is you're basically sharing in the upside of this insane network effect, basically. It's a, it's a um, network, right? You're, when yeah. you own Bitcoin, you own a piece of the network. And there's only, one, there's only 21 million pieces of that network. Yeah. You know, as you, you know, as the network grows and expands, the value of a Bitcoin will go up proportionally, or actually it's exponentially to the number of users. So that's called Metcalf's law. Mm. So you could square the number of users on the Bitcoin network, multiply that times the transactional value going through the network. And that model is 94% correlated to the historical price of Bitcoin. And that model says today Bitcoin should be worth thirty-eight thousand dollars, and it's trading for like twenty-two thousand. Mm, interesting. And that's that's like a uh, to me that's a a financial calculation that the average person doesn't understand how to make, and is what these kind of conversations are very interesting for because that is a a skill that you personally have acquired and understood what it means, but are able to translate it to people like myself or, you know, whoever might listen to this, this, this conversation. Um, wh where does it mean that the price is going? I mean, you see extraordinary different. Yeah, it doesn't mean, um, yeah, yeah. You know, no one can predict that. Predictions, so. don't you? Um, okay. And so Brian, so yeah, you're, you're building a business in the space. Um, mm -hmm. I note that you use the phrase blockchain rather than specifically Bitcoin. So I'm assuming you've got a wider thesis, which I'd love to hear as well. So talk me through what you're doing with your fund. Mm -hmm. So our fund, the goal of the fund is to outperform Bitcoin and do it with less volatility. And so the reason we have that goal is because anyone can just go buy Bitcoin. You don't need to pay an asset manager. Mm -hmm. You don't need to pay a financial advisor for the whole Bitcoin. You can go to Coinbase, you can go to PayPal. Venmo, Square Cash app. You know, there's all sorts of ways to get access to Bitcoin without paying manager fees or, you know, paying, you know, like carry on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're investing your money in the blockchain space, you know, the goal should be to outperform Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you should just own Bitcoin. Correct. And so that's what we do. We, we, our goal is to outperform Bitcoin, do it with less risk. And the way we do that is we're a value manager in the blockchain space. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for, you know, unique and novel ways to invest in Bitcoin at discounted prices. So we buy Bitcoin from bankruptcy courts. We buy Bitcoin from miners who need money today that will give us future discounts on their Bitcoin, you know, a discount on their Bitcoin in the future. Yep. Um, you know, we have, there's all sorts of weird ways that we. Interesting. Look for, Talk to me about that, Bitcoin. Brian, because I, I mean, maybe you can't share all of them, but. So that's interesting. So there's a business model that's developing where there are um, people with cheap energy that are running ASICs, however they do that. They're generating Bitcoin, but they need cash flow now rather than in the future. So they're willing to discount their future Bitcoin earnings to um, people that supply liquidity today, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. so we haven't done that trade in a year, but you know, a year and a half, two years ago, we were doing a lot of those. Wow. So the miners were wanting to buy more mining equipment they didn't have the capital to do it. Yeah. So we would buy their future Bitcoin at a discount today to wow. give them cash so they can buy more Bitcoin. And you know, we're basically buying their hash rate. Yeah. Um, and, so, and so for the mining business, does that mean the mining business has raised debt? No. They're, they're selling future cash flows. Yeah. They're so, selling. Yeah. It's almost like a futures contract. It's called a yeah. hash rate contract. 
Yeah, really interesting. Okay, cool. Um, any other fruity examples you can mention? And are you are yeah. you investing in other blockchains aside from Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. um, so the other ways, um, so we're one of the largest buyers in the world of Mt. Gox bankruptcy claims. Okay. So I mentioned back in 2014, Mt. Gox went bankrupt. Um, if you had Bitcoin at Mt. Gox, they still custody 141,000 Bitcoin. So you're due your proportional Bitcoin back. So if you had one Bitcoin at Mt. Gox, um, the trustee will pay out 0.1785 Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Plus there's about $700 of currency in those claims too. Mm -hmm. So when we started buying those, we were paying $500 a claim. Mm -hmm. So we were getting a $200, dis $200 discount on the cash and getting the Bitcoin for free wow. on those claims. Wow. Um, our average cost is $1,200. Per claim um, and those claims are worth about four thousand dollars today awesome wow okay and so that's that's people who had deposited bitcoin with mount gox that just wanted to get something out and so they came whatever right, exactly they had Here's like 500 a bucks. great i'll mm -hmm. take you know people had thousands of coins in there so 500 bucks is actually you know quite a sizable amount of money i imagine um yeah. to some of the depositors wow cool okay um and so do you invest in other blockchains alongside the bitcoin ecosystem we do um, okay. So um, uh, Binance is one of our larger holdings, BNB tokens. Mm -hmm. um, so Binance is the largest crypto exchange in the world, um, represented by the BNB uh, token, uh, which is basically the equity in the project. Mm -hmm. um, and what makes that attractive is they take 20% of their free cash flow and buy back their own tokens in the open market and burn and destroy them. Mm -hmm. So the float is actually getting smaller and smaller every day. And so as they do that, then the price will eventually go up as a negative inflation rate. Um, Binance is very profitable. Their revenue in 2020 was 5 billion. In wow. 2021, it was 22 billion. Wow. Yeah, it's growing dramatically. And um, so, yeah, Binance is one of our favorite companies out there. Interesting. And, you know, I do... Um really resonate with the kind of Bitcoin maximalist philosophies in some senses. Um, I just a brief bit of history, but my father sadly died when I was 20 years old. Um, he was only 48 at the time, had a heart attack. Um, we sold our family home and I inherited some money as a young man. So from my, you know, early to mid twenties, I've been looking to invest and the game is obviously, you know, inflation is eating your money. Where do you keep your money? Well, you have to go and, you know, build a, diversified portfolio and I've invested in a number of different assets and what really um, hit home about Bitcoin is this not only concept of self-custody so no one else has your money like you can literally like only you can move it um, but also that it's very simple once you get it you just need to buy and hold Bitcoin there's really very little else that you have to go and do and so your job as an amateur stockbroker or real estate investor or whatever is no longer needed it's like oh oh brilliant so actually this is the fastest growing asset no one else can touch it because it's in self-custody brilliant i don't need to spend all this time worrying about you know losing what i was given um and there's a lot of distraction from the wider block blockchain space and there's obviously a huge discussion as to like you know scammers and this kind of term gets thrown around all the time um equally i really affiliate affiliate more and more with the kind of libertarian philosophy and therefore, you know, do what the fuck you want, right? Like, don't, don't listen to anyone else and go where you think is interesting. So uh, talk to me a little bit about some of those, perhaps they're just my personal readings of the marketplace, but there's going to be people out there that will be not interested in putting money into a fund that has anything other than Bitcoin investments in it. But then equally, there are huge opportunities elsewhere. And, you know, what is the beauty of entrepreneurship? Well, it's trying new things. It's creating value where it didn't exist before. Um, do do any of those things resonate with you? A hundred percent. So you, you, we talked earlier about industries that are going to get disrupted. You make a perfect point that the financial advisor industry, mm. why do you need financial advisors if you have the perfect form of money, which is Bitcoin? Mm. You don't need them. Well, you don't. So, no, that's why you don't see Merrill Lynch and Stephen Nicholas and Edward Jones and Wells Fargo advisors. They don't offer Bitcoin to their customers. Because once their customers understand that just owning Bitcoin is better than using my financial advisor, what's the next thing I do? They're going to just fire their financial advisor and put everything in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's, 
yeah, it's, you know, and so it's a discussion I'm having with my, uh, with my siblings and my mom at the moment, to be honest. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, that's a, you know, that's a great point that you made. Mm. Um, you know, the disruptive nature of it and the threats that, you know, there are to the financial advisory community out there. And I'm a former financial advisor, mm. you know, I, I mean, I, I, you know, you know, I don't need a you know financial advisor if I can just own Bitcoin. Yeah, you know, I self custody. It's you know, it's the best performing asset ten out of the past thirteen years. You know, the, the only thing you have to be prepared for is that you know every once in a while it drops seventy percent. So mm. just you know, you have to be able to yeah. stomach the seventy percent drops um, and you know just hold on. You don't want to sell. Um, but you know, my advice to people is you buy Bitcoin and you never sell it. You know, um, you know, just buy and hold you know, focus on the next 10, 20, 30 years. Mm. And you know, in the United States, if you buy and hold, you don't have to pay taxes on it either until you sell it. Mm. So as long as you don't sell it, there's no, it doesn't trigger any capital gains tax for you. Mm. Yeah, and I, and I see certainly, well, maybe you've probably seen pitch decks on this kind of thing, but um, supplying liquidity for Bitcoiners is presumably a huge opportunity going forward. So... Uh, I mean, some of the blow-ups we've seen recently with these yield platforms that, you know, the likes of Celsius, et cetera, the difficulties they had in actually doing what they were selling, i.e. keeping people's Bitcoin safe and creating yield, like incredibly hard thing to actually do effectively. Um, h- how might that problem be solved in the future, do you think? In the, okay, fine. We might see Bitcoin become legal tender and therefore the capital gains on it no longer exist as it's considered more of a currency. Um, mm-hmm. But equally supplying people debt against their digital assets is presumably, I mean, I would take it today if I didn't think it was too risky. Um, have you seen some interesting propositions in that kind of space moving forwards? And what are the other exciting areas of, of, um, of innovation you're seeing in this whole space? Yeah. So I, I've avoided, um, you know, recommending to people that use what are called centralized finance platforms like mm. Celsius, Voyager, you know, three arrows, you know, block fi, um, just because of the risk that we just saw, you know, that if they're undercapitalized or there's a run on the bank, you know, who's the backstop? Mm-hmm. You know, there's no FDIC insurance out there. Mm-hmm. And you're not talking, the government's not to bail you out if these companies have financial issues. And that, that's exactly what happened. So, but the DeFi or the decentralized platforms, um, MakerDAO, Avalanche, they shine brightly through all this. They didn't have one lick of trouble. Um, because they were fully transparent and, you know, they're, they're blockchain based and, you know, there's, you know, like I said, full transparency to where all the assets are um, mm-hmm. with Celsius Voyager, all, all the other ones that, you know, we didn't have that transparency. So, so to answer your question, no, I wouldn't loan my Bitcoin out to anyone. Um, mm-hmm. I would just keep it safe and secure. And, and the only reason I, I would ever loan it out is if a big like bank, like JP Morgan or, Goldman Sachs or something that has some guarantee behind it that's FDIC insured, mm-hmm. then it would, you know, if, if those companies failed, then, you know, you, you would get your Bitcoin back. Yeah. So that's where the, the traditional finance system will slowly but surely come into the space and start offering products because they'll see that they can make margins where they want to make them, et cetera. And they'll be backed in a traditional, in a traditionally regulated way. Um, and that's that's presumably not far off. I mean, the amount of, well, just the whole the whole family wealth management model is being turned on its head as we speak, and mm-hmm. the predominant holding of most families going forwards will likely be something like Bitcoin. Um, I believe it's Bitcoin myself, but who knows? And and therefore offering services in and around it to help them, you know, buy houses or buy cars or go on holiday or whatever will be necessary. But a full diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds and currencies and you know every other different alternative that a manager comes across that they see as a good allocation won't be necessary at all, um, which is a completely different way of, of storing wealth over time. Uh, it's very exciting to think about how it might look. Um, so Brian, I'd like to take a bit more of a personal turn here because I heard you mention that you, um, you're in a wheelchair uh, in Robert's mm-hmm. podcast. And this is a, a, a podcast that's really focused on people's personal journeys. Um, could we talk about that for a moment and, and sure. how, um, 
yeah, how did that happen? And, you know, how's it been? And what are some of the biggest challenges? And, um, and, and have you negotiated that process through your life? Yeah. So um, the accident happened when I was 16 years old back in 1984. Um, wow. I was in a car accident that left my legs paralyzed. So um, I, I was driving home from the mall and I hit a pothole and it popped the front tire of my car and put me into a skid into a telephone pole. Wow. And um, when I hit the telephone pole, I you know, broke five ribs, both my collarbones, left arm, left leg, um, but two of my vertebrae that severed my spinal cord. And so I was instantly paralyzed. Um, and so you know, at the time when I was 16, wow. uh, six foot four, about 200 pounds, very athletic. Um, and you know, I went from you know, being you know, kind of star high school athlete uh, being in a wheelchair and um, lost about 60 pounds. Um, and, you know, you know, it took me a good year and a half to get back in the weight room, lift weights, get my muscle mass back up. And, um, and then I ended up getting a scholarship to play wheelchair basketball at the University of Illinois. No way. Um, and so I um, played wheelchair basketball for the U of I. Um, the two years I played for the U of I, we won both we won national championships both both years. Are you kidding me? Um, but it but it wasn't because of me. So oh come yeah. on, no, well, it was part was, of the team, Brian. Wasn't a very good, yeah, I wasn't a very good wheelchair basketball athlete. <laughs> um, and then um, yeah, so you know, I ended up getting my pilot's license when I was twenty. Um, you know, I you know over the last what's been that was nineteen eighty nine. So over the last um, you know like 34 years, 33 years. Um, I have like 2,200 hours of flight time. Um, fly a little Cessna airplane, you know, single engine propeller. It has a hand control on it so I can control the rudder pedals and the brakes and stuff. Um, yeah, so wow. I still drive, I drive a car, fold up my wheelchair, throw it in the back seat. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very independent. Um, you know, and then my, uh, between my, um, sophomore and junior year went to Cambridge and London School of Economics. Wow. Um, did my study abroad over there in a wheelchair. So, wow. Which was, uh, you're from England. So, you yeah, know, back cool. in 1988, it, it wasn't very accessible. No, so, I mean, London's yeah. so old. Like, there's just, yeah. that kind of thing just wasn't invented. You know what I mean? It's a 100 year yeah. old, 120 year old tube system, for Christ's sake. It's, yeah. And wow. So, Stephen, yeah, Stephen Hawking and I were the only two people in wheelchairs at Cambridge wow. Wow. back then. Um, but yeah, I, I was just back over there a month ago teaching at the judge business school, okay. um, you know, teaching MBA students about Bitcoin and blockchain. Wow. So. And Brian, this is, this is what I really love connecting with people and talking about. It's, um, how we overcome challenges. So I can only imagine what it must've felt like, you know, the day after you woke up after that accident, you're 16, you're like, Oh my God, what just happened? Like it, it's, yeah, I mean teach me a bit it, what was it like i mean you woke up the next day and you're like you must have thought that the world was ended basically i mean um how do you how do you pull yourself up from a position of of seemingly like down and out to you know within a couple of years you mentioned you know you're traveling and you're studying abroad and you're part of a team that does really well and admittedly a uh, a wheelchair basketball team which you would never have imagined yourself in but like i don't know you just like humans are incredible. They just dust themselves off and they go, all right, bring it on. I can, I can do something else. Um, yeah, I mean, talk to me yeah, a bit about saying, that journey. I mean, how does it feel? Yeah. Um, I, I really was never depressed or like, you know, I was never in a doom and gloom state. You weren't. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. No, it was, you know, I, I guess when you're 16, you're pretty optimistic. So. Yeah. I, I think I have a, I was born optimistic. So I just, you know, my, my dad told me, you know, you know, he said two things to me. He said, one, um, at least you didn't hit your head, right? I didn't have brain damage. True. So even though I don't have, I can't, don't have use of my legs, I have use of my brain and my arms and, you know, which is, you know, you know, you know, I, you know, and I read a book when I was in college, yeah, I forget the name of it, but it basically said something to the effect that you'll make 10 times more money using your brain versus your back. Okay. Which kind of, you know, kind of <laughs> resonated. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, well, since I don't have my back, I have my brain. So yeah. I'm not going to be poor. So, so he told me that. And then the other thing my dad told me was that um, play the cards that you're dealt. 
you know, like the old poker saying. And, um, you know, these are the cards I was dealt. So I'm just playing the best hand I have. Brilliant. It's, um, oh, it's an amazing story. Well done. And to go on to, you mentioned you, you're married and you have kids and, you know, it's, um, it's incredible what people do with their lives. Well, thank you for sharing all of this, Brian. Um, so, so what I'd love to know is to, to bring it back to Bitcoin then and, and where we're at today. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges that this, the space faces, do you think? Um, so obviously this is a Bitcoin focused podcast, people, personal journeys. I'm doing this because I believe there's, uh, there's stories from all over the world to be told that help translate this opportunity to the average person which doesn't have to be um, wrapped up in economics and uh, you know, what a blockchain actually functions like, i.e. computer science, um, but more just about telling stories. What are some of the biggest challenges we need to, to overcome in order to help people see this opportunity and um, the space itself as it matures? Yeah, the, the first thing that people need to be aware of is that there's a lot of misinformation out there. You mm -hmm. know, the powers that be, the companies that are going to get disrupted, you know, you have to understand that they're motivated, they're incentivized to put out a lot of fake information about Bitcoin. So a lot of fake information has to do with the ESG concerns about Bitcoin, that Bitcoin's dirty or not environmentally friendly, and that's completely false. So <clears throat> the, the data that you want to look at is, you know, this is from Cambridge University. The, the Center for Alter, um, Alternative Finance at Cambridge, Judge Business School, they put out data on Bitcoin mining. And so the data shows that 0.06% of the world's electricity is used for Bitcoin mining. So 0.06%. So even if you shut down the Bitcoin network, that has no meaningful effect on greenhouse gas right? It's 0.06%. Mm. So that's the same as uh, dryers. If you use an electric dryer to dry your clothes, that's, you know, the worldwide uses of dryers is the same as the Bitcoin network. Um, it's equivalent to Christmas lights in the United States. So, you know, it's, you know, so people are saying that it's not eco-friendly. Bitcoin's not eco-friendly. So that's false. It's such a small amount of electricity relative to other or, you know, other uses of electricity that it's just, it, there's no meaningful difference between having Bitcoin turned on or having it turned off. Mm. The other thing I'd like to point out is that around 58% of the electricity that's used to mine Bitcoin comes from green or renewable energy sources. So that means that the Bitcoin industry is the greenest industry in the world. There's no other industry in the world or no other country in the world that has 58% of their electricity coming from renewables. And so this ESG misinformation that's out there is being driven by the proof of stake um, competitors against Bitcoin. And it's being driven or it's being driven by likely countries that don't want to be displaced by Bitcoin. And it's being driven likely by companies that don't want to be disrupted by Bitcoin. It's actually laughable, isn't it, when you break down the, the electricity mix and look at the total consumption of Bitcoin mining versus other areas. I mean, it, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Because you hear the headline, Bitcoin mining uses the same amount of electricity as Ireland or some other right, exactly. you know, arbitrary kind of nation state. So, all right, well, hang on. Why isn't everyone writing articles about the fact that electric dryers use exactly the same amount of electricity as Ireland or whatever the comparison is? It's, right. it's kind of like cherry picking things that they know are going to make people scared and, oh, I can't go near that. And, and I've seen this in, in even, well, in, in smart people as well. Like they just haven't looked into it. They haven't thought about it. But um, I, I personally, I went very deep down the kind of clean tech rabbit hole. So. I was, um, I was actually working as a shipping broker, helping to move fossil fuels around the world. I did that for kind of five years in my mid twenties, uh, got frustrated and, and left and wanted to work more on climate change. It's a very millennial focused kind of subject and spent four or five years doing that basically. So looking at, um, angel investments in clean tech startups and trying to found some of my own businesses and came across things like, you know, demand side response and looking at electricity grids and how renewable adoption means you need more flexibility and 
um, you know, how we can process waste foods into creating protein and all sorts of interesting stuff. But at the end of the day, there was a whole load of very mission driven, talented people in this area that are like, climate change is the biggest problem we've got. We've got to do something about it. Um, but you mentioned Bitcoin to them and they're like, it's, it's environmentally unfriendly. I won't go near it. And you're like, but okay. And then you could, you know, want to get into a conversation with someone about some of these statistics. And I've personally now come almost full spectrum to think that Bitcoin's the most important long-term sustainability tool that the human race has. And that's largely due to time preference and understanding that, you know, having a lower time preference changes the way that you consume resources. That's actually going to change things, but not right. some arbitrary government regulation about how much carbon is going to be in the air because people are going to play the game and make money where they can and ignore them where they want. So right. it's, it's fascinating that to me, there's just so much amazing talent wrapped up in this clean tech um, entrepreneurship space that are completely blinkered to what Bitcoin is because of the kind of articles we're discussing and they just write it off straight away. So it's a brilliant point, like in terms of misinformation, it's absolutely everywhere. But when you start peeling back the onion a bit and start looking into it a bit more, like, hang on, so what does an inflationary currency do from a perspective of long-term resource consumption? Well, it incentivizes short-term. That's why it's happening. You go, oh, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And then you become, you know, a whole hogged Bitcoiner and you start making a podcast and all the rest of it. But um, right. How interesting. And, and you must end up in conversations like this all the time where people have basically they, they cite things that are incorrect or poorly framed. Yeah. Wow. It's one of those things, isn't it? You just don't understand how big the misinformation machine actually is. And then you That's go, well, huge. hang on. What else do I think is true that isn't true? Right. Yeah. And, and so, you know, the governments around the world know that they can't prevent you from owning or investing in Bitcoin. Mm. Um, but what they can do is try to convince you you don't want to do it, right? Yeah, wow. So, yeah, so they, they can't stop you. So their next best alternative is to try to convince you or brainwash you into thinking that it's something dirty or you don't want to touch. Mm. And that's an interesting point as well about um, the incentive. Like the fact is, you know, most people will say Bitcoin government's going to ban it. Okay, well, why haven't they done that? And to your point because you can just access it and buy it anywhere in the world. And they would have already banned it, presumably. I mean, do, do you see that as a threat? Actually, that's probably a better way of taking the conversation. So is, is an all-out government ban something that you foresee happening? Um, and, and why or why not is that the case? Okay. So um, it's going to be country by country. Um, but in the United States, Bitcoin cannot be outlawed. And the reason is back in 1996, um, there was a company that wanted to export their cryptography software. Mm. Um, and so the Department of Defense sued and said, we don't want this software outside the US because of national security reasons. And so that court case, it's called Bernstein versus the DOJ, went all the way to the Supreme Court. In 1996, the Supreme Court of the United States declared that cryptographic software is protected under the First Amendment as freedom of speech. It's language. Software in the United States is already been declared as language by the Supreme Court, and it's protected by the Constitution. And so you cannot outlaw software in the United States. That's all Bitcoin is. It's just, and, and it's specifically, it's cryptographic software, just mm -hmm. like the Bernstein case was back in 1996. And so, you know, so in the US, the U.S. government cannot ban software or Bitcoin. So, but what they can do is try to convince you you don't want to touch it. So, yeah, or tax it, uh, and, and that's you know. fascinating, isn't yeah. it? So that's brilliantly put. So there is li there's a legal precedent specific to crypto software that means the U.S. government simply can't ban it, and and mm -hmm. that is just not that's just never spoken about. Well, at least to my knowledge, I, I have just read about that specific story in a book I'm looking through at the moment, and I have heard it mentioned on a couple of podcasts, but I'm fairly deep down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. The average person is definitely not aware of that fact. Okay, interesting. And so going forwards, do you, do you think ESG will be um, the, the number one source of misinformation towards Bitcoin? Is that probably the easiest? So the ESG concerns use? are starting to actually clear up because um, mm -hmm. the, the factual information is coming out. 
So mm -hmm. once someone takes time to look at the facts, it's clear as day there's no ESG concern around Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I don't think ESG is going to be a continuing issue in the future. Cool. Okay. Um, well, Brian, listen, an hour or so is coming close to an end. Thank you so much for, um, for spending some time with me. Um, perhaps sure. you could just uh, lay out how you see the next kind of five years playing out from a, uh, a perspective of an investor. So, um, you know, why is Bitcoin an interesting investment over the next five years and what conditions are particularly interesting to you as to why you think it's an interesting place to be, uh, to be putting your money? Okay. So what we are going through right now is a crypto winner. So, you know, Bitcoin hit a high of 69,000. It dropped about 75%. You know, it's back up to like 22,000 now. Mm -hmm. um, this is, you know, we've had these crypto winners before, back in 2018 and back again in 2014. Um, these are normal occurrences where Bitcoin drops this much. Um, it gives investors a good time to accumulate Bitcoin at these lower levels. Um, and, you know, that's, I'm not telling people to buy Bitcoin, but I'm telling you that our models, our Metcalf's model says it's worth 38,000. Um, our trend line analysis says it's worth 89,000 today. Um, the stock to flow models say it's worth around a hundred thousand dollars today and it's selling for 22,000. So in our opinion, Bitcoin is significantly undervalued, but I don't know when it's going to go up. So, but it gives you a good opportunity to be buying today. Um, at, the, at these low valuations. Um, what I expect to happen over the next five years is in the spring of 2024, we'll have the fourth Bitcoin halving mm -hmm. to occur. And so we're gonna go from basically 900 Bitcoin a day being generated to 450 Bitcoin a day being generated as the reward. And historically, um, Bitcoin does really well starting about six months before that halving occurs up to about 12 to 18 months after that. Mm. And so I, I would think later this year, um, you know, we'll start to see Bitcoin start to move up. And then there's a couple of catalysts that are gonna happen over the next year or two also. So one of them um, is recently just happened was that Fidelity is starting to allow their retirement assets to have access to Bitcoin. Um, another um, catalyst is that FASB, which is the Financial Accounting Standards Board, um, which controls what's called gap accounting rules mm -hmm. um, that public corporations have to use. Um, they voted seven to zero a few months ago to change the accounting rules around Bitcoin. And it's gonna be, it's gonna allow companies to have more favorable tax treatment on Bitcoin once that rule gets changed. And that's scheduled to take effect Q1 of 2023. Wow. And then, you know, if that happens or when that happens, you'll see a lot of public corporations buying Bitcoin, wow. um, a lot more public corporations. And then the third thing um, that's coming up is that um, there's not a spot Bitcoin ETF in the United States. And we expect that to occur sometime over the next couple of years, too. And, you know, when there's a spot Bitcoin ETF, that would give more investors easier access to owning Bitcoin. Mm. And so that's a essentially a fund that people can put dollars into, get Bitcoin exposure in terms of price, and mm -hmm. they have liquidity in and out of it more easily than teaching a large investor how to self custody a billion dollars or something. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, that'll completely change things, won't it? So essentially, those are all triggers for additional adoption, um, mm -hmm. and that's your your S curve essentially playing out, isn't it? And inevitably, with a finite resource and additional demand, then we hope to see the price move up with it. And that's what's exciting in terms of number go up technology. Um, yeah, very cool. Okay. Well, Brian, final question is, um, where can people get in touch uh, if they want to reach out? Yeah, um, our website is offthechain.capital. Um, just as an offthechain.capital. It's not .com, it's .capital. Cool. Um, if you go to our website, um, we share our um, valuation charts on mm -hmm. the website. So you know, people can go and take a look at our valuation models on Bitcoin. And there's a, there's a contact form on there too, um, where you contact us. And you're raising funds or it's an open-ended fund? How does it work? Yeah, we're, we're an evergreen fund. Um, we have a million dollar minimum um, mm -hmm. for limited partners. And mm -hmm. um, you know, we currently have about 230 partners in the fund today. Great. Well, Brian, best of luck with the fund. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story with me today. I've really appreciated your time and 
it's again it's it's always fascinating to me when someone with you know an investment background like yourself has seen an opportunity and they're reapplying skills they picked up from previous cycles or different parts of history in terms of investment to to reapply that to bitcoin today um yeah it's absolutely awesome well thank you for your time really appreciate it thank you thanks for asking me jake pleasure